hello and welcome to the Two Real Cinema Club. I'm James Rizika. And I am Andres Lorente. And at the Two Real Cinema Club, we watch a couple movies, usually one old, one new. And then we talk about the two and uh, make some connections. Or disconnections, I disconnections, guess. Disconnections, reconnections. I was, trying, I was thinking about this this afternoon. I was thinking that this, this podcast, it's a little bit like a word search. Hmm. Where all of the words that you're searching for is movies. Yeah. Yeah, movies, yeah. movies, <laughs> but not, not as in the names of different films. It's just it's just six letter word M O V I E S in every like in every that. direction. And we haven't we haven't gotten to one the, of those word searches that I can actually do. I was going to say we haven't gotten to the point where that's the only connection we could make between <laughs> two films. They're both <laughs> movies. Yeah, it's a connection. Oh, well, yeah, you're too fussy. Um, uh, as always, uh, I'm going to appeal for you to to come and contact us because uh, we're lonely and we need validation. So you can find us on Twitter. At uh, Two Real Cine Club at twitter.com. We're on Instagram, Two Real Cinema Club at instagram.com. We have a blog, uh, Two Real Cinema Club.com, where we write various nonsense about either the films that we've watched or, or films that aren't in the pod. Uh, you can email us, reach us out. We, uh, we, we, we long for contact. We are uh, mm-hmm. Two Real Cinema Club at gmail.com. Just email in, say hello. We'd love that. And finally, if you're enjoying the show, or if you're not, tell your friends. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever else you get your podcasts. And we're on YouTube. Uh, We're all over the Internet. Uh, Say hello. Listen to the show. Uh, So uh, happily, this episode, uh, it's Andres who has chosen the movies. So things are uh, back to a little bit more highbrow and intelligent. (laughs) Oh, Rather goodness. than some kind of crazy sci-fi nonsense that I've chosen. So this episode, we're talking about Close, um, which is uh, a new Belgian film. Uh, and then comparing that to 1999's Boys Don't Cry, uh, directed by Kimberly Pierce. Um, so uh, we'll start with the new film, uh, as we always do. Uh, you turned me onto this. You saw this uh, when it was out. Uh, at the cinema locally, didn't you? How long ago did you see this? Uh, it's been, I think, five weeks now that I think about it. Yeah, at the, uh, I saw it at the local art museum, which shows uh, films, usually independent and foreign films. And it had just lost or was just about to lose the best foreign picture film to All Quiet on the Western Front. Ah, pod yeah. favorite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although it did, it did win. It won the, won the, the can. Grand Prix, didn't it? Ah. Uh, last year, which I had to look this up. So the Grand Prix now, it's like, I think it's what used to be called like, in a certain, certain regard, something yeah. like that. But it, yeah. it used to be like considered to be the the the, um, the, uh, the second best, the runner up prize. Yeah, exactly. That can. So they had to change the change the name of it so it didn't sound quite so much like a runner up prize. Yeah. Um, so Triangle of Sadness won the Palm d'Or, oh, no, uh, yeah. but Close um, won uh, the Grand Prix. Okay. So, uh, let me tell you the story. Please. So uh, the film is set in contemporary Belgium. Uh, about two 12-year-old boys, Leo and Remy, and their very close friends, uh, as implied by the title. So they play together, they eat together, they sleep together, they live in each other's pockets. Is that something you say in the States, living in each other's pockets? Is that God. a British idiom? Do you say that? God, no, you would not say that in the States. That sounds... Uh, <laughs> no? Yeah, that sounds okay, terrible. Right. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's the British thing. So um, after a blissful summer, uh, the two of them both go up to middle school. But there, some of the other children start to taunt and bully them over their closeness asking well if they're gay so leo uh is desperate to fit in so he denies this vehemently and he starts to distance himself from remy uh and eventually uh after they've grown further apart one day leo fails to wait for remy one morning so that they can cycle to school together and so remy challenges this rejection and the two boys have their first fight and then not long after this events take a more Dramatic turn. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you saw this film, um, were there many in the audience? Oh, that's a good question. Um, probably 70 or 80 people, something like that. Okay, yeah. well, not bad. Then. Not okay. a bad audience, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, kind of we saw it at home. Um, 
together. And I'd be interested to know how the audience um, react, because there are a few kind of you know, very dramatic moments in this film. I know we tend to um, focus largely on the writing. And I tell mm. you, there's one thing which um, I love probably more than anything else about this film, which is how tremendously underwritten it is. Yeah. Um, when we were both at film school together, um, the, the screenwriting tutor used to often use this phrase. He was talking about looks and glances. He was saying, you, know, you tell the story with looks and glances. And that is absolutely um, how close works. Most of the story is told with looks and glances. I don't know whether you've ever written, I've ever, ever read um, Story by Robert McKee. Do you know that book? I skimmed it because that was the hot book yeah, right, right around that time, right, two, early yeah, 2000s. Yeah, story. exactly. Yeah. About 20 years ago, this is like you know, the hot screenwriting book. And I think I did yeah. the same as you. I went out and bought it and I read like about the first half and it's yeah. terribly, um, you know, it's, it's far too long and far too detailed. It's very long. Isn't it the <laughs> book that, um, it, what is the film with, uh, oh God, our good old friend Nick Cage? Oh, yes. Uh, Orchid, Wild Orchid, White Orchid, Orchid? No, what's it? It's all about orchids. Yeah, well, the, the, fil the film that's about the writing of the film based on a book about orchids. Yes, but it's uh, oh boy, it's he plays himself and his twin brother. So it's and it's based on Robert McKee and then sort of what would, would be Robert McKee's um, twin brother. And I know the name. It's a one word title. I should know it. Separation or uh, adaptation. Look. Adaptation. 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 There you go. Um, so I think yeah, doesn't doesn't um, Robert McKee make a you know or a Robert McKee like character <laughs> appear in that movie? Exactly. I think it's Brian Cox. Yes, I think it is, isn't it? <laughs> he so, does a great so, job. So uh, like in that book, like his main principle yeah. for writing a screenplay is that he says that, um, you know, and, and this is a principle that other people adhere to as well. He'll, he'll say that you have to make sure that every scene yeah. has a dramatic purpose. Mm -hmm. So like every scene has to feature a reversal yeah. or a change or a pivot. Mm -hmm. You can't end a scene in the same place that you started a scene, every scene has to earn its place. And I can understand, you know, a producer will tell you, yeah. you know, it's going to cost $20,000 to film this particular scene. Yeah. Does it have to be in the, in the film? You know, do, is this necessary for the story? Is this scene, you know, the thing that people would say is, is the scene working hard enough? You know, is it earning its place? Um, and this film is the absolute, opposite it's probably one yeah. of the most underwritten films i've seen for years insofar as i would say that almost none of the events you know events with a capital e yeah. in this film actually occur on the screen so for almost every event in the film we see the world before it we see the world after it we see how the world changes when the events happen but we see the story kind of in retrospect or kind of sideways on we see it you know, reflected in a window or a mirror yeah. the story is told by you know a broken door handle you know, that you glimpse out of focus. Oh. You know, the, the story is told by, uh, you know, an emptying bus. Yeah. Um, rather than you having many scenes um, uh, of people telling each other what's going on or the camera following the action as it happens. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a proper joy, isn't it? You have to do a little bit of mental work to make sure that you keep up, but it means you end up with a very authentic feeling um, bit of story. Very real, right? It ends up being very, very real. Absolutely. Realistic. It's very, very believable. You you sort of just stole all of my thunder for the entire pod. So <laughs> I don't know if we end now or we just listen to you the rest of the way. But um, I, I agree with you entirely. And um, like this one thing that really struck me in this film is the set. The set pieces don't exist. They don't occur on screen. And set pieces are super expensive. Um, for example, the concert that there, – there are two concerts where um, – Remy's performing and the focus is really just on the two boys watching each other one while he's performing and one um, watching uh, the Leo in the audience um, and that could have been done you know with more shots of the whole interior and it's it's almost done as if it's just a chamber and it's just the two of them looking and glancing um, or the bus scene that you occur to I mean you think you're going to get taken into this school and there's going to be this big um, session talking about what happened uh, between the boys or what happened to one of the boys um, because we haven't Wrong the spoiler bill yet. The won't bell, talk yeah. anymore. Um, but that scene again could have been a big set piece and it's not. And that's, that really occurred to me like set pieces are so fake. They're kind of artificial most of the time, the wedding scene or the big funeral scene or whatnot. Um, and as a result, this it's smarter because you're shooting a less expensive scene. Um, and that might be one of the reasons it's underwritten. Um, but it's also just, I think it's more believable as a result because these are believable events, not these over the top things that have to be organized and, and catered and such. So, um, it was. It's interesting in that way. I think uh, I agree with you. Spot on right there. 
Shall we ring the bell? I think probably Thank we should because there's yeah, uh, uh, there's a you know important thing that happens at the midpoint which makes it difficult to discuss the film without revealing it. So, so ring the bell now. Ring the bell. You know how much I spent on this bell. I'm going to ring it. It tolls for thee. That's, I'm never going to get tired of ringing that. It's good. <laughs> it's it's fun. I like that. I like it. it's good. It woke the dog up. Um, so, uh, so there is a central tragedy um, in this film, and uh, I. I don't want to give the impression that the um, the way that the film is underwritten means that it is also very loose because it's it's kind of it's not loose. There's a very clear structure here, I think. Again, kind of just focusing on the writing, which is only a small aspect of what I think makes this film so good. But um, there are clear act breaks, aren't there? And the, the this is a device that we've seen you know in other films. The, the, the film is shaped around the shape of the school year isn't it it's measured yeah. against the changing seasons mm-hmm. so leo and his family they are flower farmers or flower growers like they run a flower nursery something like that you know and um you know it's and it's not a particularly subtle use of symbolism but it's mm. tremendously effective that yeah. these flowers are an important part of telling the story the flowers are in full bloom during this kind of early summer of the boy's friendship you know and then uh, um, content warning um, Remy takes his own life and uh, following that you know we have scenes where the flowers just like turn into mulch they're churned up yeah. by farm machinery um, as the boys kind of um, you know separate and then are separated forever and then you know at the end of the film you know the, the, the same symbolism comes back into play doesn't it because you know Leo goes through you know a, a, a big transformation he has to come to terms with what happened and his own role in it and as he starts to move on you know we see the new blooms start to emerge there's a scene you know right at the end of the film um where leo confesses his feelings to remy's mother um and uh you know and that happens like in a forest of like saplings it's these young trees that are growing up i mean it's you know it's a very um consistent use of this kind of this nature and this flower imagery to illustrate the story but i think it really works i agree with you yeah it's it's beautiful and the the running through the fields makes it it's very sort of minorly epic i guess um these running through the field scenes and they and these bicycling scenes as well so you really get a sense of the landscape and how the landscape affects them um and it also defines the characters quite a bit too i think his his parents leo's parents are um farmers and when i think when we get to Boys don't cry. This will become a bit more clear, but like the, there's a very different sense of the the quality of people or the style of living uh, between the parents and the families in this film as compared to the ones in uh, Boys Don't Cry. They seem very like liberal and understanding and uh, sympathetic, and that's not the case in Boys Don't Cry. Um, and it's it almost feels like they're tied to that land in that way. It's such a beautiful setting. They must be doing pretty well. I mean, they're living pretty well as as flower farmers. And then I never. Uh, the Remy's mother is a nurse, maybe a um, uh, what is it, a NICU nurse or something like that? Or yeah, a... it's a skibu, I think, is what we call it in this country, the special okay. care baby unit. Okay, yeah, there you so go. it's yeah. like it's like intensive care for newborns. Yeah, so I mean, they have they have like caretaking jobs or jobs that are uh, bringing beauty or, or service to the world, um, which we don't see in Boys Don't Cry, and I think that's something we'll, we'll talk about a bit more when we get there. Um, but I think the landscape defines them and just the, the sort of culture that they live in. And it's also, so they're, they, they are French speaking families, but they're going to school in, is it Dutch or in Flemish or something like that? Yeah. It's like one of the teachers talks in Dutch, like the, yeah, the hockey teacher talks in Dutch. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was a little bit confused about this. Initially, I just assumed the film was in France, but I'm sure it's in, it's in Belgium, isn't it? And yeah, like Belgium's. It has like three national languages, yeah. doesn't it? Most yeah. people speak French, but some people speak Flemish, and yeah. some people speak, speak Dutch. And I'm guessing it's not a big country; it all just gets mixed together. Yeah, and it seemed like for the, the those students, they were learning Dutch at the time or Flemish. I'm not sure. I mean, in the school, they they seemed like it was definitely a, a you know not their first language that they were learning and going to school in a different language. And it was, uh, but I think the girls when they're talking to them, like, there's a lot of scenes that happen in the school, as you said, it's based around school year. Um, but the kids talk a little bit of a mixture of French and other languages to one another, which makes it, it's just a very rich environment. It's a, you know, I think, and that's an intentional thing, just as you said, it's intentionally based around the school year and the seasons and the flower industry. Um, I think it's also intentionally set in this fairly open-minded uh, community and 
they seem they seem quite sophisticated. I think that makes a big difference. It makes Belgium look like a fantastic place to live, oh, doesn't yeah. it, frankly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. Makes me want to revive Pub Guide again and get over there and make a, <laughs> a beer film. Oh, nice flat bicycle riding, no hills, just flowers. Yeah. And, oh. Oh. Um, in, in the UK, Belgium's got a bit of a reputation for being a boring country. But if that's yeah. boring, you know, I, yeah. I'll buy it. It looks it good. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll do that. It's interesting you're talking about the children's scene. So there are a lot of scenes set in the yeah. school. Yeah, yeah. Um, and those scenes, you know, maybe inevitably because every film refer with you know with children in a school refers back to this. They reminded me a little bit of Cares. Yeah, I think you know most of that children's dialogue is largely improvised. Yeah, uh, it doesn't really feel like that. You know, the, the children feel kind of quite natural and um, unstagey. Yeah, and it gives it again. It's, it's that sense of authenticity, isn't it? Yeah, great um, and great, great adolescent acting. I mean, I didn't have a problem believing any of the characters and i think you you might have a point there that they were probably told what they needed to say in scenes but it might not have been too closely scripted and I, i've seen that recently like I, if i write for kids i i fortunately work around well fortunately or unfortunately i work around <laughs> high school students all the time so i can i can imagine how they would speak and how they say things naturally that i wouldn't write naturally um so perhaps uh lucas don't gave them some some liberty with how they were going to phrase things but this is what has to has to happen in the scene and it is the kind of film where i feel like they shot probably a lot of extra stuff just because um um it's loose in that way you've mentioned it loose in the writing but also loose in the filmmaking um in terms of it, it, i don't know if they were in session in school session at that time if they had access to the school for a couple of days or something like that but you know it just nothing felt horribly staged it all felt really pretty natural and that's the, you know, kids were probably speaking naturally as a result. There's a, another kind of looseness to the film, which is a, there is a kind of narrative and character ambiguity that runs all the way through the, the film. I mean, there are you know, simple plot points like, you know, it's, it's never explained in detail how Remy took his life or you know, exactly what happened during his last hours. And you know, most films that would deal with, you know, the non-accidental death of a young person yeah. um, would probably go into that in quite a lot of detail. Yeah. The other thing is it's never really spelled out precisely what the boys' feelings for each other are. You know, uh, you know they're 12 and they're very young and you know, it's mm -hmm. not clear how much of this love is sort of platonic and how much of it is kind of, if not sexual, then sort of sensual. Yeah. Um, I did read after seeing the film that I think you know, the intention was to give the uh, the impression that Remy probably uh, was gay um, and Leo was rather more ambiguous. Um, and having read that, I can see after the fact, oh, you can, uh, maybe that's one way to interpret it, but I don't think it... Um, I don't think it comes across as a definite single interpretation of the way that the characters' minds work. I, did, I read an interview um, with... Uh, uh, it's uh, what's his name? Lucas Dont. That's it. Who's the director? Um, uh, and uh, he was kind of saying that um, we're talking about uh, how people need to put things in boxes yeah. to label people as either you know are you gay or are you not? Um, he read this. I wrote down this quote in my notebook about how he says how we want to compartmentalize everyone into boxes and labels, mm -hmm. and how we want to put a stamp on love, not let love exist in its true free form mm. there is something uh, joyfully carefree about their kind of um you know their closeness they're kind of like soulmates these two boys you know they're very close but their closeness spills out into their physical relationship as well as their sort of mental psychological one it's this very sort of sweet clear you know, innocent friendship mm -hmm. but even when you might call it innocent, I still think you know there is a sensual enjoyment to one resting his head on the other, or you know the closeness that they have when they share a bed. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sexual thing, but it's a you know a, it's a physical pleasure, which is part of the pleasure of enjoying somebody else's company. Yeah, I agree. You know, he he can. He, it's interesting because he can talk about not compartmentalizing characters but to a certain extent he does such a great job of leading us to that it's almost like you're compartmentalizing the audience you're taking them right to this is the implication here you know do with it what you will um but i definitely had the 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 sense that um uh that remy might have had more than platonic feelings for leo but it wasn't it wasn't over the top by any means it was definitely subtle 
but I think he takes the audience there, and that's I think that's just a sign of good filmmaking. He's he's giving us an idea that we should probably bite at and and follow down the rabbit hole a little bit. Um, so I thought he did that very well. It's not overt. Um, it does. There are questions, um, but it's enough. The, I think the thing that's really compelling is it's enough to take the story to a tragic place and then have to have have the protagonist have to deal with the aftermath. I mean, it's interesting what he chooses to focus on because it is. You know, it is very much like Leo's story, isn't it? And you know, the yeah. camera naturally gravitates to him. You know, in in every scene, and he absolutely holds your attention. Yeah. But there's, you know, enough ambiguity and looseness in the storytelling that you don't feel that you are, um, you know, entirely seeing the world from his point of view. Uh, he still feels like a little bit like a, you know, a little bit of a closed box. And I wonder whether his feelings are a closed box to himself in the same way that when you are that age, I think you may feel things and then not really understand what those things are or how, what they mean or how you feel about your own feelings. Yeah. And that's a, it's a hard thing to do is to balance this idea that your protagonist is 12 or 13 years old. Doesn't, you know, not a fully formed person. Uh, Remy, who takes his own life, also just not not an adult by no means, you know, a, a completely grown person. Um, so you expect them to, to wrestle with some of these issues. And Leo definitely wrestles um, throughout the rest of the film. Once, uh, once Remy has gone, those early scenes, um, I know we've talked about authenticity, but they kind of really remind me of, of both kind of, you know, happy fleeting moments in my own young childhood. Mm. It's like, you know, if you kind of, asked me to go to my happy place one of the places i will go to is just like running around it would be like at the age of five i think yeah you know with um you know with kind of sort of school or preschool friends even like in that kind of blinding sunshine where you can feel the warmth of the sun on your skin and the light is so bright you almost can't see and you're just kind of you know running around enjoying you know the the the, the warmth of the air and the flowers and the smell and the company and and um Everything just kind of rolls together into this, you know, blissful togetherness. Yeah. Um, and then I've seen the same thing in my own children that, you know, the, oh, yeah. The, yeah, the kind of joyful running around in the sunshine, that kind of aimless yeah. running from here to there. You know, that's that's, you know, the, the joy of childhood. Very cleverly captured um, in this film. Yeah. And it's a beautiful film. It's beautifully shot. Um, the landscape's fantastic. I, I really enjoyed it. Um the misstep for me, and I, you tell me what you think. I felt like the 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 looseness and that underwritten quality we've talked about sort of catches up with the film towards the end because I think I think it ends a little later than it needs to, and I think there's there are three or four possibilities where Leo needs to do what he does in this film towards the end and to bring closure or some sense of closure to um, Sophie Remy's mother in particular. And I think that just, it took a little too long. That's the one place place where it felt unnatural to me. I felt like it could have been more effective um, if he, he didn't have to fail at doing what he did so many times. I mean, it's obviously a very difficult to, thing to do. He's sort of explaining what happened uh, between him and Remy. Um, but it seemed like it took a little long. There were the, the moments were there, and they he let them go. I, th- I think not necessarily because it was too difficult, because the moments were these very like alone moments with um, Sophie. Um, but it took a long time, and then eventually he has to you know traipse across town and take public transportation to get to this hospital where she is. And I mean, I understand why why Don did that, but he took a lot more time than I thought he needed to. And I think it just. For a film that didn't drag and didn't misstep at all, all of a sudden I felt like it could have been a little tighter. I, I must say, I didn't come away feeling the same way. I think okay. the film is the right length. Okay. I do wonder whether maybe, you know, at this point, I I can identify the point um, where it drags a little bit, like, mm. you know, just in those last 20 minutes. Yeah. And maybe, the, you know, there are slightly too many scenes yeah. of... Um, unpacking plants you know at the nursery or maybe sure. slightly too many scenes of of leo throwing himself against the wall at um ice hockey practice yes um and so yeah i mean it, it could have lost 10 minutes but then i wonder whether part of the challenge is to to try and transmit how very very difficult it is for yeah. him to say out loud mm-hmm. what what he feels inside what he knows he really should say um so I you know, I didn't come away with that, um, but I can see where you're coming from. Good, good. 
I tell you what, um, this is normally the part of the show where we put in a call to your and my favourite, the Cliché Squad. And I'm not sure I've got anything to call them about this week. What do you think? I'm, I'm going to whisper because I don't think it needs to be a complete call to the Cliché Squad. <laughs> You mean it's just like a like a, an email to the tip-off line? Precisely. It's like one of those emails to the Two Real Cinema Club that never come. Okay, well, let's, let's email. We'll send a text to the Cliché Squad okay. this week. This is my text, um, and it's totally understandable, but um, the, the, the sensitive, artistic, potentially gay teen or preteen i don't know i guess he's probably just a teen he's the oboe player and the potentially <laughs> hetero preteen is a hockey player it felt a little <laughs> a little crude but i get it i understand it and it works in the story but it, it it certainly went along with convention i guess that's kind of conventional thinking he's a beautiful oboe player um puts on a beautiful con- uh, um, uh, concert and Le- that's that's Remy's character, and Leo, of course, um, I think in part to get get away from, like, to become diametrically opposed to the the creative type, the artist type. He all of a sudden pursues um, ice hockey. So, I mean, there's an early scene between the boys, isn't it, where Leo says, oh, "I'm going to draw a portrait yeah. of you, Remy," and yeah. he draws his portrait, and it's you know it's a perfectly acceptable portrait for a twelve year old, <laughs> but it's not a masterpiece. No, no, you know, no. And they both laugh at how bad it is. I think yeah. a bit unfairly. It's you know it's a better portrait yeah. than I could do at twelve. Yeah. Better portrait than I could do today, but it's um, I, I I suppose you know they are you know maybe going over that familiar ground of. You know, gay means artistic. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know the gay men, they're good with their hands. Yes. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose you're right. I think, I think um, maybe the cliche squad should put them under caution. That's just a whisper. Yeah, that's that why one. I don't... It's just I, a whisper. And again, because it's otherwise it's such a wonderful film and near perfect that I wouldn't, I wouldn't call the cliche squad. I love the cliche squad, but I hate it when they're overworked. And they, <laughs> they, get, just, they deserve a week they, off. They've been overworked. We've had our vacations. I think they need theirs. Okay, well... Um, uh, that's about as much as I have to say about Close. I think it's a terrific film. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't catch it in cinemas. It is streaming in the UK now. Okay, good. Um, deserving of its Grand Prix. Yep. Terrific picture. Interested to see what Lucas Dunk comes up with next. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's have a break and then uh, we will come back and we'll talk about Boys Don't Cry. <laughs> This episode of the Two Real Cinema Club is brought to you by the TRCC Florida Driving School. Learn to drive like they do in Florida. Learn to overtake on the right, overtake on the left, overtake using a random combination of two lanes. Any two lanes will do. We'll teach you how to break the speed limits at random, how to indicate at random, turn your lights on and off at random, exit the freeway at random from any lane. And finally, how to park at random, using up to four parking spaces at once. And all using a modern family car, bigger than two buses welded together with a third bus balanced on top. (laughs) Learn to drive like they do in Florida with the TRCC Florida Driving School. Because if you don't, someone else will. And they might be driving behind you right now. Ooh, I just had a quick look (laughs) over my shoulder. (sighs) <sighs> we just came back from florida and you know it, it's funny because it's true yeah and it's not just florida it's a lot of the united states but um <laughs> I, I, it's some it's some bits of britain but it was really noticeable in florida i'm sorry and I, I suspect half of the bad driving was british tourists who were over there for the holiday but still <laughs> <laughs> And we are back from the dangerous roads of Florida and the beautiful, the beautiful environ of uh, Belgium, France, and any other country that they border on. I thought it was Dutch at times, too. That was the thing that uh, was confusing me about close. But um, all the cycling, isn't it? All that cycling. Yeah, it's the biking. So much movement. 
cycling and they're flowers as well that's a dutch thing isn't it yes well but the dutch are tulips right they're really crazy on the tulips and i couldn't figure out exactly what the flower was i have this program on my application that identifies plant life just by you know you take a picture of it basically and then it <laughs> and it tells you that's a plant yeah <laughs> <laughs> in many cases but most often it gets you right down to the binomial nomenclature it's fantastic oh my god yeah yeah it's good um so we're going uh, from ooh, this is a hard transition from <laughs> the beautiful Belgian France or any European countryside to... Benelux. I think we should call it Benelux. Benelux, That's, that's what the Europeans call Benelux. It's, it's that a, covers a lot, of, a lot of ground. There you go. Beneluxian film. Uh, we go to Nebraska. Oof. It's, uh, it's dusty, at times muddy, and people... What do they call that? Bumper ski or ski ski ride? Yes. People fall off trucks for yeah, fun. Exactly. Yes. So they uh, get around and rip up dirt <laughs> in the back of trucks while they are uh, trying to throw them off. Um, so this is Boys Don't Cry from 1999. Um, for me, for me um, uh, one of the, the main players is Christine Vachon, who's just this great independent producer. So this is one of her earlier things. If you look up Christine ah. Vachon, she's done so many different things. And she wrote a book that I have skimmed a little bit more than story, but uh, by uh, McKee, but this is a, a killer life. Um, she wrote it. So it's a really good book about uh, producing independent films. And this is a very, very independent film, kind of at the height of the American indie uh, movement in 1999, mm. written by Andy Beenan and Kimberly Pierce, who also directed uh, the film. So it's an early, I think it might've been Kimberly Pierce's first feature film. I think it was, yeah. And she hasn't done an enormous amount since then, actually. So she made, um, I looked it up, Stop Loss in 2008, yep, yep. so nine years after this, which I have not seen. That's a kind of a, a U.S. Army veteran movie. Okay. And then, and then she made the Carrie remake. That's right. In 2013. Interesting. Which I have seen and which is kind of disappointing, oh. which is not, you know, um, not a film that yeah. I would... Uh, compare to this but. odd mix of films yeah um but then it's, it's a question of how much you can get made isn't it yeah now you you picked the films this week i did i did this, this is our new our new feature um which is just tell us why how come you came to pair boys don't cry with with the uh, close do you have any other questions for me counsel i don't know <laughs> I don't know. I think... Excellent answer. And pressing on. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we, per, from a, a paucity of options, I think that might be what it is, is that um, um, I, I loved Close. I loved the fact that it was, um, you know, dealt with these kids who were potentially uncertain of their sexual identity. And I thought, well, uh, the Hilary Swank character, and Hilary Swank is great in this film. She really put herself on the map and I think won some big awards. She may have even gotten a Best Actress at the Oscars. She and, did get the Oscar, yeah. yeah. So she definitely got on the map on this, but she's playing a slightly older person who seems very certain about her sexual identity. Like, there's no there's no um, question in her mind. I thought that would peer, uh, play pretty well together. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thematically, I thought they were, you know, they're not that close thematically, I guess, but um, in the same neighborhood, even though Nebraska's I... nowhere near Benelux, I figured <laughs> these two films are in the same neighborhood, so... I think, no, I think I think they have a, quite a lot of common ground, yeah. actually. I don't know. Well, well, no, well, we can talk about that yeah. later on. First of all, why yeah. don't you tell us the story? I will. I will. I mean, I've got to cut down what I've written to because <laughs> you are laying down the gauntlet. It's much longer. Anyway, bleak, flat, dusty, boring Nebraska. Um, is where this thing takes place. Uh, Tina Brandon passes Eb as Brandon Tina. Gets a little confusing. Um, and this is based on a true story. I've done a little research, and I think you have to to figure out how much is true or what plot, plot points are true. Um, but um, he garners some bad attention when he's roller skating and kissing a young girl, and he has to leave his town, or I think the Lincoln, Nebraska area, which is kind of the big city. He ends up meeting with this woman, Candace, and her brother and his guy friends, um, Brandon gets into a fight and leaves with the gang for a town called Fall City. That's a red flag right there. I would not go <laughs> spend an hour, nonetheless, uh, weeks in a place called Fall City. Um, it's a, about an hour away from his hometown, I think. Um, Brandon becomes smitten with Chloe Sevigny's character, Lana, um, who sort of has a complicated relationship and a very childish mother. Right. Who is uh, an al uh, alcoholic, too. So here we're getting into that family thing that I was talking about with the first film. Um, her mother is probably, what, late 30s or 40s, maybe, and dating John Lotter, who is um, 
uh, played by Peter Sarsgaard. Um, mm. And that's when Brandon starts to prove his toughness and sort of masculinity by bumper skiing is what they call it. They're, you get in the backs of these picker pickup trucks. I mean, there's probably not a lot to do in Nebraska. <laughs> So on a Saturday night, people drink a lot of alcohol. Everyone's got a pickup truck, so there's no shortage of pickup trucks. And then you stand in the back holding on to... It's almost like water skiing in the back of a pickup truck, and the driver, who's probably not sober, is trying to get you to fall <laughs> out of the truck. But this is Nebraska, so it's normal. Um, at the same, I think in the same night that that happens, um, Brandon is also sort of um, haunted or visited by a menstrual cycle that he must hide um, cause he's trying to, um, keep the fact that he's actually a woman or is born, a um, woman assigned, what do we say these days? We say a gender assigned at birth would be a female. Yeah. Um, ends up staying around town too long because he's in love with Lana and he sort of becomes a part of the whole gang and sort of becomes a member of the family in the process. Um, uh, let's see. And, but is very much passing as a man, uh, he wears his breasts wrapped very tightly, carries, um, I don't think you'd call it a cod piece. It's like this latex penis that he yeah, uses, uses yeah. in a love scene with uh, Lana. So they're obviously getting very intimate. Um, so, uh, again, Nebraska is probably not the most exciting state, and the characters drink a lot, and uh, they're just trying to escape ennui, I think. Uh, Brandon gets into this drag race, troubles ensue, the police stop him, but... Uh, the computers are conveniently not functioning, so uh, he maintains his uh, secret identity for a little while longer. Um, but then the rifts start to emerge. John um, and Brandon actually fight over the police stop, um, and Tom, who is John's sort of past partner in crime and best friend, and he's also a psycho, uh, also gets more involved in the story, and Brandon's ignoring these major red flags everywhere gets more involved in their lives. He goes back to um, Lincoln, I believe it was, for a court appearance, um, but he fails to appear. So uh, Brandon had apparently, I think it was Grand Theft Auto, stolen a car or something like that, Mm, had some serious things that he had to face in court, but he actually um, just sneaks out and goes back to Fall City. (laughs) Twice? (laughs) Crazy. What are you thinking? Um... Brandon and Lana consummate their relationship. Uh, Lana remembers this the night well, and I think I want to talk about these flashbacks a little bit with you as we get uh, moving along because they're a big part of the film. Um, uh, and she sort of was she, she's explaining to Candace and another friend what happened um, because I think everyone has these questions about Brandon, and she remembers seeing some cleavage on Brandon when they were making love. I think that was the. The image that uh, quickly ah, comes true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but Lana's sort of willfully ignoring the fact that uh, maybe Brandon was born uh, a woman. Um, and then John's character, that Peter Sarsgaard character, has creepy feelings for Lana, who sort of wrote to him when he was in prison. <laughs> He's dating her mother, um, and he really doesn't like her getting together with Brandon. Um, and Brandon and Lana are sort of advancing in their re- relationship and their romance, and they have these plans to go to Memphis together. Um, and Brandon's telling all these lies about his family and his past and they start sort of, everything just starts building up on him and, um, he eventually gets busted for impersonating when paying some fines and he's writing bad checks. So his real identity comes out. Um, Alana finds, Lana finds him in the women's cells at the prison, bails him out. Um, and John learns the truth. Um, and then there's this incredibly intense scene um, where Tom and John are forcing Brandon to prove that he's a man in Lana's house. They're sort of stripping clothing off him. The whole family's around. It's it's one of these. It's a great scene because it's so tense. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to watch because it's difficult, but it's a great scene. Um, but it's a little bit marred by these sort of out of body experience shots and um, a, f- a few moments that take you away from the real intensity of the scene. Um, I think. See, I th- it's interesting you say that. I think that that mars the scene. I yeah. think those little out of body experience shots yeah. are an outstanding bit of the story. Oh, actually, okay. it's, it's like because um, I think it's like kind of depersonalization. I think, and this is it's like this notion of your body being your own, and yet also yeah. you know when something is very bad happening, you're kind of watching yourself from the outside. Okay, and and um, and also um, sort of Brandon's notion of kind of wrestling with who he really is and yeah uh, I, I think i think that's um a really great bit of filmmaking actually okay. that's some strange 
seeing yourself from the outside. I, 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 yeah. I like that. I think for me, it was execution. It felt a little clunky. Um, I understand right. what you're saying. It's almost like uh, Brandon here is sort of living the two identities at once. Trying, there's this one identity trying to leave behind, and then this later identity that you know is the the desired identity. And, uh, yeah. and fighting for it to a certain extent. It's, a, it's an intense scene. I loved it. Uh, I thought it was just so powerful. Um, I didn't love it for the content or uh, anything like that. But the, it's, the yeah, it's a very committed scene. God, isn't it? the it's act, really going very, the, very intense. Yeah, and all the actors are full on. And it's, I think it was probably yeah. very hard to shoot. Um, so John and uh, Tom take uh, Brandon to this remote location and violently rape him and swear him to silence. And it's another very intense scene. Like the, there are three. I mean, the, the whole of the rest of the film from here on is so intense, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, oh my yeah. God. I mean, yeah, I was watching it between my you know, fingers. Yeah. And um, Brandon ends up going to the police for sort of like a rape test. And uh, it's a very peculiar, unsympathetic, but very 1990s interrogation by the sheriff. Um, yeah. Ooh, and I got I want to just single out this one moment of acting because it is it's fantastic. Um, the sheriff is interrogating uh, Brandon, and uh, Hilary Swank playing Brandon has to say these two words that are really hard, and um, she almost swallows them. She says "my" yeah. and "vagina" together, and it's yeah. just I mean it's so powerful because she can't even say it. She can't even say that. Uh, um, she has one really. It's just a, it's a wonderful pairing of the words and just a beautifully delivered. Uh, she practically swallows them and it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I think uh, for me, the next little bit does derail a little bit. There's some flashbacking. Maybe if we'd told it, the story more in sequence, it would have been a little easier, but I, I understand the director's choice here that, um, so I sort of goes back to a flashback to see what happens after that rape scene. So we've gone from rape scene to the interrogation and um, turns out she went back to the house. They they told her to clean up. She escapes through the bathroom, and she's she's really wanting one last chance to escape with Lana. Um, and they've decided to go to uh, at least Lincoln together, and maybe to Memphis. But John and Tom turn up, and with guns and knives, boy, it's a violent scene. They catch up with uh, uh, Lana and uh, Brandon at Candace's house. They kill Brandon with a gunshot, and then I think, what is it, Tom jumps in for good measure, does some stabbing as well. Yeah. Uh, Candace, who's totally in innocent, is caught up in the fray. She's killed right in front of her toddler child. Um, and it's based on true events, and I had read that Candace's boyfriend, I think it was, or a friend in the house, was also killed. Yeah. Um, and then we get this sort of last oh, epilogue-like scene where there's a letter that's found, I think, and maybe Brandon's jacket to Lana or left behind in the house because um, uh, originally Brandon was going to go on without her and try and have Lana join him. Um, sort of gives voice to, to Brandon one last time and sets up Lana. For, there's this uh, bit at the end where she's going to go off to um, Memphis on her own and sort of live out their dream. Um, so that's Boys Don't Cry. Oof. Oof. Uh, yeah, and it is uh, very intense. I remember watching it at the cinema yep. in, nine, in like 2000 or yeah. 1999 when it first came out and finding it very intense there. I think I had forgotten a lot of the story beats there. So yeah. watching it again this week, um, it, it is you know, a very intense film. And it is an absolutely outstanding uh, you know, career making, deservedly yeah. so, performance by Hilary Swank. I mean, just yeah. astonishing. Astonishing. Really. And, and it, I, I had never seen anything in film like that before so that's yeah we're looking at 20 almost 25 years ago i i like yeah. you i saw it in the theater i think i saw it again 2000 i think it took a little while to sort of move around because this is a very independent film um and accomplished with i imagine a pretty small budget i didn't research the budget budget online just, just under two million yeah. bucks is what i read tiny so, um, so small yeah, yeah. and you, you see it sometimes in um the sound quality is sometimes lacking um there's some lighting decisions that don't really look that professional but they might have been just using street lights nearby or you know headlights on cars and that sort of thing mm. I mean, there there's some moments where you think okay it's a little too bright for this scene or it's not bright enough and um but it all works it pieces together a very 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 good film absolutely yeah it's like the you know the, the story the character is what takes you through the whole story yeah, the whole whole film so absolutely i talk just talking about you know like to kind of talk about the writing it's got this really really simple um shape this film it's it's basically a triangle isn't it i was trying to kind of sketch it out that kind of it's you know it starts with 
you know, Brandon's life basically on the up from the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, when he goes on this kind of roller roller skating date with yeah. a girl and then moves to Nebraska. And you know, even his setbacks, um, you know, in the early parts of the film, he's still smiling and laughing. Yeah. You know, nothing can hold him back. Yeah. And he, you know, he moves to Nebraska. He meets Lana at 18 minutes in. I, I noted it down. Okay. Um, you know, and then, and then, you know, his life is gradually just kind of getting better and better. There are a few kind of, you know, tricky moments and run-ins, but you know what? Things are getting better and better. And then, they, you know, uh, Brandon and Lana finally make love like at the midpoint. Yeah. You know, and that's the, that's the apex of the triangle, the mm-hmm. peak of the movie. And then everything progressively unravels from sure. there. And it's just a slow, continuous decline yeah. to the absolute rock bottom from there. It's just a straightforward triangle. And it completely works like that, I think. Yeah. The one thing is the pal the the palpability of uh, Brandon's and Swank's happiness on that upward arc. You mm. constantly smiling as you mentioned, and, and it's just it's a character who is sort of becoming his his true self, I guess. And you can yeah. see the elation just leaving one part of Nebraska behind and going off and being able to become the person that um, he wants to be. And that that is an incredible moment, and you can see it on Swank all the way. And then the downward part of that triangle, it's totally understandable. Humans make terrible mistakes. And especially when you're um, in love or you think you're in love, um, you don't always make the best choices. And it's, as I said, you go to Fall City. I love the fact that it was called Fall City. (laughs) But there are just so many red flags. There are so many reasons to get out. But obviously the love for Lana is what prevails. And so that you're right. It's a precipitous fall uh, down towards ultimately death. And uh, it's. You know, it's tragic, but it's true. A lot of it was uh, very close to yeah. And in some ways, I wonder if it was too close to the truth in some ways. But um, it makes a great story. It's a great story. And it's a great film. Um, it, it film. I, one of the things I've put in my notes here yeah. is there's like a little storytelling beat in this film that mm-hmm. I think belongs in absolutely every film. Okay. Um, and you know, I'm always disappointed when I, I see a film where this doesn't occur. Because I think it's, you know just central to storytelling in general, which is um, this moment when the protagonist makes a choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we saw with, um, uh, with close that Leo, um, you know, he chooses to, you know, get closer with the hockey players and yeah. to distance himself from Remy. And this is what precipitates the whole story. Yep. You know, in this film, you know, early on in, in the second act, Brandon has a choice basically to either hitch a ride back to Lincoln yeah. with this kind of slightly dodgy looking truck driver guy <laughs> yeah. to appear in court and you know, get his life sorted out and do the sensible thing. You know, or he can stay you know, with Lana and his buddies in Fall City and he chooses. And you see this moment where he chooses to stay and all the rest of the events of the film flow from that choice. Yeah. You know, and it's and it was like you're just a just a passing moment and this fleeting choice, you know. And if that one choice had been different, it would have been a very different story. Yeah. You, know, you see him making the choice, and that makes everything that happens after it that much more poignant. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a really kind of simple. It's almost like a trick, really. It's like that hero's journey beat of yeah, of refusing course. the call, isn't it? It's this, this very simple little story beat, but it makes everything that flows after it. You know, that more powerful. Yeah, or the choice to leave the courtroom is also a very obvious choice. Could have uh, sort yes. of come clean with the law, but makes this one choice not to to stand before the judge and figure out what's going to happen. Be, again, driven by love for Lana and the desire to get back. Um, the way in which it's almost too real for me is that I felt like the, the tense scene where they are um, learning the truth about Brandon's um, uh, gender identity... Um, is that's kind of that climax for me. And then, sadly, more stuff happens. I think that's what it is. I think, I think I'm disappointed that the the characters just didn't, you know, defriend him or say, you can't hang out with us anymore. But they have to go on and rape um, Brandon first and then get revenge by actually murdering her. So that's why it's almost too true, because you've got these two other beats that because you're doing... It's not a biopic, really, but you're doing a film where you want to honor the story. You've got to put these two other ugly moments after this big, ugly thing has happened. And you could end yeah. a film on that, on the other the, the other scene, and it would have been intense um, and, you know, oddly satisfying in terms of story, not satisfying in terms of, oh, it's a happy ending. Um, but you, the directors and the writer, they decided to keep in uh, those other two scenes. And, you know, that does a great service to... Uh, uh, 
Brandon's life, but at the same time, it makes for hard watching, and it feels like, oh, I've got more conclusions, and it's just going to get grimmer and grimmer. And as you said, it yeah. really goes from absolute bottom to absolute high, right back to absolute bottom. So it's it's not an easy film. Um, how did you feel it aged? I was a little worried that I had this odd feeling about this film. Like in some ways, it feels like we've come a long way, but we actually haven't. When we're talking about transgender issues or LGBTQ issues, I don't think we've actually um, evolved too much in twenty. For 25 years um and i, th- I thought it felt very contemporary i yeah. mean it, 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 contemporary enough that it was a little bit of a jolt when um brandon is on the phone to his cousin you know and, and it's like you know it's a phone with a, a wire oh, yeah. it's, it's like yeah. you know it's a, it's like a hard line or whatever it's a <laughs> yeah land, land it's landline. Like a, a landline that's yeah. it yeah and suddenly realize oh wow wait a second yeah this is, <laughs> film isn't happening now i think i mean like just as you say the gender politics of the film feel really contemporary i think yeah. it's crazy to think the film is 24 years yeah. old yeah exactly the events in the film are 30 years old you know, what has changed what's moved on how can this still be like a political hot potato yeah that, uh, another question is that something you say in the states hot potato absolutely you don't want to hold on to you it, okay, right, it. Right. yeah or you throw it okay, to someone that's else one for one okay there good we go job, okay, right. good so, job. So living in each other's pockets thing that doesn't work but hot potato that works okay yeah if, if you want to go to jail you can live in each other's pockets i suppose that's gonna get you <laughs> into some trouble i think but hot potatoes okay. that's safe that's safe right i mean i think the, the way the film discusses gender dysphoria i mean there, you know that, that wasn't something that you would see you know in a news yeah. article those words you know 30 years ago yeah you know and it discuss, discusses like gender affirmation surgery you know it feels like it's it was made this year yeah yeah um, it's interesting it's once i'd made a little note of this in my notebook as well that yeah. brandon says when he's trying to explain to lana um about kind of being Trans and he's kind of says i have this thing it's not that rare actually you know in, in 1999 yeah. i'm sure that line kind of went straight over my head yeah um and it's you know it's only now in 2023 you realize oh yeah it's actually you know a, a pretty salient fact yeah. that's being dropped in there it's a thing it's not that rare that's not making you know, a big deal of this yeah yeah so i i personally feel that it's aged tremendously uh, well yeah it, it does so, have yeah. it does feel like a sort of a, like a 90s um a 90s movie insofar as it has that kind of grunge yeah. soundtrack, doesn't yeah. it? Oh, yeah. It's just that kind of dates it a little bit. But even that is, I, I feel like maybe that's the natural soundtrack of Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, well, like we say that of Maine too. So musically, we're stuck in the 70s or something like that. So, yeah, well, yeah. That, it's being stuck in the 70s. That's not bad. It's not bad. It's some good music. The 90s? I like the, I'm a 90s kid too. So I, uh, I, res- I respect that. I, I like the music. I thought it was... Uh, it was good, but yeah, it seems like I, I think it feels for me. It felt dated in the sense that we should be farther along. I guess that's what it was. So I'm yeah. not, I'm not surprised that we haven't evolved enough. Um, but it, 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 it's kind of one of those things. Like, wow, we're still kind of in a, in a slow moving place on these issues. Um, but I did enjoy it a lot, and I think it's, it's for me. It was um, very much like the good and bad of fairly simple people, unable or unwilling to accept complicated truth i think that's what kind of came to the surface for me in this and then i kept thinking about close in the sense that the the families are so different lana's household is dysfunctional a lot of the kids in nebraska you know tom and john have been in prison already um you know their their lives aren't really going anywhere they have you know very very hard looking jobs that don't pay well um didn't seem like anyone had a lot of education or finished schools you know there's the alcoholism yeah. of lana's mother and you, i compared that to the fairly sophisticated families in um in close close yeah and how you know like the homosexuality was not really an issue that wasn't the problem it was the fact that something happened because the friendship broke up you know and i think uh they would have been supportive of their children either way you know whatever their however they identified um in terms of sexuality or gender um, but you don't get that feeling in Nebraska of the 1990s, whereas you do in Benelux of the uh, <laughs> 2020s. Yeah, it's another reason why we want to live in Benelux. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the thing that makes um, uh, Boys Don't Cry absolutely is the characters, isn't it? It's this, yeah. The character work is just outstanding. Great. All of the characters, apart from you now maybe lana's mother who is she's a little bit one note because she's basically just perpetually drunk but yeah i would say all of the other characters like a really proper three-dimensional well-rounded yeah you know, characters they have proper depth yep. like not just you know brandon has you know there's many aspects to brandon's character it's kind of you know good boy bad boy ambiguity self-confidence self-loathing 
kind of you know planning for the future and sort of maybe being unrealistic at the same time sort of being reckless and impulsive but sometimes being a realist sometimes being a dreamer like all these different um aspects that make a unified proper character the other characters as well like you know lana she's she's contradictory and complex yeah and like one of my favorite moments in the film and i know that um the real uh lana uh, on whom the character is based she sued the filmmakers because she felt that she was portrayed um unfairly yeah uh or un unrealistically in the movie um when when lana sees that brandon's being kept in the women's section of the county jail yeah she is both surprised and not. Yeah. It's like it's, it's this thing behind her eyes. She Actually, she kind of already knows. Yep. And I, I hate to draw, this is like, you know that I provide the crass in this podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer my, my, um, my crass uh, comparison here. The thing it reminded me of slightly, uh, you know, and I'm not a big fan of Star Wars, but Luke's reaction mm. to being told by Darth Vader, oh. I am your father. That's the single best dramatic moment in all of Star Wars. <laughs> and the reason it's the best moment is because you can see in Luke's eyes that he already knows yeah. that Darth Vader is his father. Yep. But it's just now that he has to confront that truth. It's not news to him. It's just that it's out in the open. And it's the same with, with Lana in this film. Actually, you know what? She already knows. And it's not, yeah. you know, it's not a deal for her. She's She is more complex and sophisticated yeah. than she would appear at. Uh, and in the same way that like John, Peter Sarsgaard's character, he's like, you know, he's, you know, he's evil and ignorant and dumb, but he's also charismatic and seductive. That's right. Yeah. You know, and kind of, you know, and, and unhinged and yet sometimes quite realistic. You know, and, yeah. And his his buddy, who is like, who is, uh, you know, a, a total psychopath, that little detail like early on in the film, where he's waiting for a ride, something like that. And what he's what's he doing while he's waiting? He's burning napkins. <laughs> Like that like tells you like so much about his character yeah, yeah. without having to use a word. That's this is what this guy does for fun, yeah. you know. It's, in Nebraska. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very good I characterization, just, yeah. Absolutely. So the characters are just great in this film. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I dreadful, but you know, but oh. But man. and so many um really early in their careers too. Yeah, wow. They're absolutely. all probably like twenty five and younger, something like that, and just nailing it in a in a really important film, so that yeah, gives, gives so, it a lot yeah. of energy. It gives it a lot of energy that is um, really pays off in the film. Yeah, exciting, significant movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we've we've talked about the characters. Mm -hmm. um, we, we ought to play our new favorite game. Who am I? Who am I? I you know I I can't no. even remember who went first last time. You are going first. Who are am you? Am I going to go first this time? <laughs> Um, I'm glad you said that because I, for once, I've actually prepared an answer. Oh, great! Um, so there is a scene later <laughs> later on um, in Boys Don't Cry. Um, uh, so after Brandon is raped, and then there's a scene, you know, this dreadful, awful scene with the sheriff. But also, um, you know, he sees a nurse, you know, who kind of you know, oh, yeah, takes his clothes off and dresses him or whatever. And it, it just that nurse who only appears for one scene, <laughs> and she has like two lines, but there's a beautifully well observed mixture of compassion mm -hmm. and frustration yeah. in that character yeah. and you can kind of see um that you know this is probably you know the fourth time this week that she's had to patch somebody up after a sexual assault and her um you know her whole image of humanity has been tainted by having to do this just this so yeah. many times oh yeah there's this kind of just this weary frustration bundled in with her compassion and kindness you know, and I, I, I sometimes, you know, that's what I feel like at work yeah. sometimes with, with kind of someone, you know, you kind of, you feel sorry for someone who's, you know, fallen over and broken their arm, but also you kind of think, you yeah. probably shouldn't have, you probably shouldn't have been punching that guy. So, um, yeah, I, I could absolutely see myself in her. Has anybody ring true for you today? Well, I'm, I'm going to, from every film from now on, I'm just going to guess that any medical professional is the one you identify <laughs> with the most. Yeah, that's about right. Well, didn't you yeah, say yeah. that in Grizzly Man, didn't you say you identified just with the coroner? The coroner. Yes. <laughs> I am so predictable. Oh, my God. <laughs> Who is just the creepiest guy. And I don't think of you as creepy, Jimmy, so I'm learning more about you through these films. Um, for me, I'm going to, this is probably cheating, but I... First of all, I'm a boy at heart, so I, feel, I just remember being 12 and 13 so clearly. But uh, I feel like both of those characters for me resonate. I played ice hockey. I was a musician. 
and I, I had pretty close relationships with a lot of uh, my boyfriends. I didn't have girlfriends until high school, really much later on. So um, I feel like I kind of a combination of both Leo and Remy. I really could, I really related to both of them. And even though it's been 40 years or more since I was that age, um, I definitely, they, they were such great characters and they, I think they were so well acted as well that um, I just really responded to the, both of the characters. So I saw the both, uh, like the athlete in myself and the artist in myself in the, the combination of the two characters. So if I could be two characters, I guess that's some sort of uh, um, um, body, um, body, disor- <laughs> dis- what'd you say, dysmorphia? Or something dysmorphia, like yeah. Maybe I have body that. polymorphia. You have, yeah. Maybe that. Maybe that's what this happened with this pairing of films. As I split my personality in two. Right. It's, it's but it's. I, they're both good boys. It's yeah. nice to want to be both of them. Yeah. I think. Good. Uh, uh, so right. Uh, let's 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 do our kind of synthesis. See if we can you know bring these two films together. Yeah. Mm. So I, I made a little, I made a couple of notes here. My top note is not much has changed, has it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which we kind of already touched on. These two films are 23 years apart. And you know what? Yeah. This world still doesn't seem to have got its act together. Yeah. I think, well, we're a generation, that's a generation more or less, right? We would say that 20, yeah. 25 years is sort of a generation. And I think that for perhaps our parents' age or grandparents' age, they would say things have changed a lot. And for us, because we're only seeing it from one generation distance, it's not enough or it hasn't changed too much. So I think that's sort of a, just a – it's almost to say that we're not old enough yet. Oh, thank <laughs> goodness. I feel old enough. Yeah, oh my yeah. God. Uh, I think that, that sadly uh, human evolution is super slow and uh, especially like um, – oh, I don't know, um, philosoph- philosophical evolution or anything that requires thought doesn't happen quite fast enough for humans. So. Um, we we haven't changed that much emotionally, but we we have made some progress. I guess it's you're right to emphasize how little there is some. When you say how little, there's at least some progress, I guess. Um, but that's and and that's why it felt. I think that's the one reason that Boys Don't Cry oddly felt dated was just because oh I thought we were beyond all this, but yeah. it was the case 25 years ago. It's still the case today. So I, I agree with you on that one for sure. I think one one really interesting comparator between the two films is something that you you know you mentioned about how um in close like the older generation they're all really supportive aren't they and they all kind of sort of seem to have their act together whereas in boys don't cry it's the older generation are are the ones you know who largely fail to understand or to exhibit any sympathy yeah but interesting so in close like the, the source of conflict um are the other children it's the other children who are intolerant yep um and I feel kind of somehow maybe that's worse, actually. Yeah. Like, I feel like if the older generation are the ones who are holding everybody back, well, OK, those people will die. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and there's a you know, chance for the next generation. If it's the youngsters who are holding you back, that gives me much less hope for the future of humanity somehow. Yeah, I agree with you. I think so, so for me, one thing that ties oddly ties the two films together is the importance of the secondary characters. Like you're, vi- these are very much protagonist-driven stories in the sense that uh, Brandon's always on screen, Leo's always on screen, more or less. There, you know, a handful mm. of scenes maybe, but um, there's sort of this genetic lottery in some ways. Like the 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 Benelux families are super sophisticated and supportive, and and evolved somehow emotionally. Whereas I think, and and, and even though there's a tragedy there, sort of they come around and they they support one another pretty well, and it's dealt with really well. Um, however. In Nebraska, um, the families are not that sophisticated and they're not that um, sympathetic. And, you know, there's a completely uh, different ending. And it's, you know, it's an active yeah. violence, whereas, the, you know, the, the, the suicide is definitely violent, but it's not perpetrated by someone in the community around the protagonist. It's actually um, coming from, you know, the protagonist himself. Um, so I think it's the influence of, of our families that really, to a certain extent, um, links the films together for me and how they react to someone who might be a little bit different or perceived as different. Yeah. Yeah. I did a little bit of reading around about yeah. Boys Don't Cry, and it's interesting how it kind of it gets bundled together in a movement with like a few other films from the same era, yeah. that kind of late 90s period. So people kind of put it in a box with American Beauty and Fight Club 
and mm. American Psycho under this theme where kind of people write in big bold letters masculinity in crisis that's you know that was the the cinematic theme for those years and i, I kind of think mm. that's sort of unfair because it suggests if you put boys don't cry under the title of masculinity in crisis it suggests that the film is about john and tom somehow like they yeah. are the men who are kind of in crisis they are the men who murdered brandon the film yeah. isn't about them and it, i don't yeah. think it's about masculinity i th i think um I think both of these films underline that you don't have to be masculine to be a man. Yeah. I think both Boys Don't Cry and Close, they're kind of they're about love and about kind of like finding a truth, I think, finding a fundamental truth in yourself mm -hmm. or in the people closer to you. You know, that, and that's a pretty broad summary, maybe. But do you think maybe that's like a, I wonder whether that is at the heart of any good story. You know, in the same way that making a choice is an essential beat, I wonder whether the uncovering of a truth is as central a part of storytelling as anything, I think. And and both of these films are about uncovering a truth. In one case, people react you know, broadly fairly well. Yeah. And in the other, they react really, really badly. Yeah, I agree with you. I have one caveat, though, because I think every uh -huh. film sort of is at one point or another about uncovering a truth, but very often it's like a very minor exposition piece. These films uncover very real human human and universal truths. There's something outside the film that's true. Whereas, yeah. you know, if it's, oh, oh my God, the, the, the third daughter was born out of wedlock by, by you know. Then <laughs> Luke, the, I am your father. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> there are those truths which I think are, you know, trivial. And those are just like story truths. But they're, these films definitely deal in universal truths. Well, to, to have made a film that deals with universal truth... Yeah, what higher yeah. ambition is there than that? Is okay, it? we have just got time mm. uh, to play, also playing oh. at this theatre. I'm going to force you to go first this time. You always see more films than me. You, you always see loads of stuff. What have you seen? Well, I will. Uh, the caveat here is that my theatre was... The, the the screen embedded in the airplane seat in front of me for <laughs> three of these, I guess. Um, well, I love that theater. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy. And you can turn it off when you need to. Um, and then one, one I saw on DVD. Boy, I feel dated Ooh. again. Um, I saw The Fablemans, which was a Steven Spielberg film that just came out in, what, end of 2022. Um, on the and how was that? Film. I did not like it very much. No. Um, I th he has formed a partnership with uh, playwright Tony Kushner for at least uh, three or four films now. And um, Tony Kushner, I don't know if it's, it's funny because it's, it's written, it's directed like theater, I guess, in some ways. It feels very stagey, which is ironic because it's about filmmaking and how he became a filmmaker. Um, and yet I couldn't tell if it's the writing. Like Michelle Williams, who was up for some awards and celebrated for her performance, felt very... Um, very stagey, like using the body way too much. You know, in film, you don't have to, yeah. you don't have to be seen from the back row in a sense. So um, my wife was watching it next to me and she said, God, it looked so, so bad because it looked, the acting was like physically overacting. Um, mm -hmm. And that was definitely mm -hmm. true. Um, and so I just don't know if that's a good partnership and I don't know if Tony Kushner should be writing films, but that's my take. Um, I'm not a big Spielberg friend to begin with, but um uh, so The Fablemans was one thing I saw. I saw Tar, which is a super kind ah. of intellectual film starring Kate Blanchett, um, made by a main filmmaker, actually. Um, Todd Field is uh, lives just up the coast from me here. Um, hasn't made a lot of films, but um, very well known for a main film called um, In the Bedroom. Ah, yeah, yes. Which is a wonderful film. Um, and it's, a, it's remember you were talking about, um, boy, Looks and glances and the twenty thousand dollar scenes mm. that should be cut. This is full of scenes and it's very much a character study of a person who's really not very likable. Um, <laughs> and it goes on for two and a half hours. I liked it. It's a lot about classical music, so I think you really need to be into orchestral music on a certain level. Um, but she's a really well done character and very unlikable. But um I'm not gonna say it's a great movie, but I did enjoy it. I saw part of the whale, which was a play. Um yeah. And that's a Darren Aronofsky film that just came out featuring Brendan Fraser, um, right. who was very, very much uh, celebrated for his, everyone thought he was dead or something, that his return and his return to great acting or whatnot. 
I think my favorite film though out of the bunch was something called Blue Bayou, which I grabbed at the library right after I returned Boys Don't Cry, I think. So mm-hmm. uh, Blue Bayou is just a couple of years old. It takes place in uh, around New Orleans. Um, so it's a, it's a man who lives in Louisiana. He was adopted from Korea um, when he was very young, and his adopted parents did not fill out the right paperwork. So he's in danger of being <laughs> deported. This is a true story, too. Um, and then he's uh, he has a baby on the way with his girlfriend, who's played by Alicia Viscander, and... He already has this, her daughter has really um, attached to him as her her true father. Um, so it's this story about him getting um, deported. And it's a very oh. honest and uh, kind of a difficult story. Really well acted. Great child acting. I think this is something interesting about this week is that I've seen great child acting or, or young mm. person acting between Close and Blue Bayou. I've seen some of the best um, uh, young actors um, performances in a long time. And... Uh, so that's a lovely film, and I would recommend that one for everyone. If you can get it on DVD. It's not that old. I don't even know why it was put out on DVD. It was, um, I think, 2021 or 2020 in the last couple of years. So very good. And at the very end of the film, they show these real-life cases of uh, people who had been adopted into the United States, but their, their adopted parents didn't do the right paperwork, so they were actually being deported. So it, mm-hmm. yeah, it's oh, man. sad but good, but I bet you saw something fun or... Action-y or... Or lowbrow, like that's yeah. correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going I'm to see your child acting and raise you with robot acting. Oh, so excellent. I, so, so I, like you, have been on a couple of long-haul flights yeah. uh, since the last pod. So I've seen loads of films, but I'm only going to mention one, which is Megan, mm. um, which is an absolute blast. So this is a sci-fi horror film with this a strong black comedy bent okay. about like a new generation of toy um, that's too smart and too capable for anyone's good and you know everything yeah. that could go wrong does go wrong with hilarious and you know terrifying bloody consequences um it's a blumhouse film so you know relatively low budget directed yeah. by gerard johnstone so he's a new zealand director he made a film called housebound a few years ago i don't know if you've seen okay. that no i haven't no which is like a small slightly culty kind of uh um ostensibly a horror film probably a horror comedy as well i would call that okay um which is great fun because that goes through so many different twists and turns. It's tremendously mm. inventive. They mm. squeeze an enormous amount out of two hours or an hour and a half. Housebound, great fun. Um, Megan, also great fun. Uh, I watched it you know, on a long haul flight and guffawed my way oh, through, good. The, through the and sky. It is, it is supposed to be comedy then. I, I, I think it's supposed to be okay. comedy. I, I mean, there are some very overtly comical characters. It is, yeah, it's, well, maybe it's satirical, but no, no, seriously, watch the first five minutes and tell me it's not a comedy, okay. it's a comedy. But you were watching with headphones on and it was a personal screening. <laughs> yes, so I was irritating all of the rest of the passengers, that's correct. <laughs> I just wonder, there, though I saw the trailer a million times and I loved, uh, there's just one moment she said, you better run. <laughs> Right? Does that happen in the film? <laughs> she's, she's about to beat this boy up or something. Like that. And she says, you better run. I mean, it looked, I just, I've got a little trauma after Cocaine Bear. I got to be honest with you. Because I went, <laughs> I thought that was going to be really funny and I was going to love it. And I was let down. And Megan, I, it was in my mind. I thought about going to see it. And then I thought, oh, it can't be as good as the trailer and as creepy. But I, I did, it still, in the trailer, it still didn't quite strike me as comedy. But that's great. I mean, maybe it's the low oxygen when you're in a semi-pressurized <laughs> airliner. I don't know. But, bit, yeah, I laughed a lot anyway. Right. Oh, good stuff. Um, so uh, that is uh, yeah. all we have time for tonight. But uh, join us next week uh, when we'll be uh, visiting the popcorn counter and talking about some dogs and I don't know what. Uh, and then we'll be back a uh, week after that with yeah. another couple of movies. Good. See you there. Mm-hmm.